Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Pruitt. Today we're going to be talking about trauma arrest, and we have some case studies to review together. To start with, when we're talking about trauma, it's very important to realize that if you see any signs of life when you get to the scene, that's a situation where you're going to initiate rapid transport. So you see any kind of agonal breathing, um, any kind of pulse, any kind of cardiac activity besides PEA on the monitor, this discussion does not apply to those patients. So if you see signs of life, go ahead and start transport. Also, the other caveat to this talk is if you see signs of obvious death, there's no need to start resuscitation or go through these steps. What we're gonna focus on today is mostly the gray area, the patients that are not necessarily breathing but don't have the obvious signs of death. So case number one, you're dispatched to a 29 Delta, it's an auto versus pedestrian. You find an adult male who's lying face down in the street and is not moving, unconscious and unresponsive. You see a deformed leg, shoulder, and he's bleeding from his head. You don't see any breathing and he's unresponsive, but there's no obvious signs of death. You put him on the monitor and you see a PEA of 30. I want you to think about what you would do next here. Case number two, you're dispatched to a 29 Delta. This is a rollover with a patient who's trapped inside. It's a 15-year-old female who requires a pretty prolonged extrication. She's agonally breathing and she's unresponsive. So you decide to load and go, but you lose pulses on the way to the hospital. What are your next steps here? And for case number three, you're dispatched to a shooting at San Mateo in Central. You're about eight minutes from the hospital. It's a 28-year-old male with a gunshot wound to the chest. He's unconscious and he's not breathing when you get there, but he's got a PEA of 60 when you put him on the monitor. What are your steps here? So the definition of trauma arrest is someone who's got no pulse and is not breathing. Essentially, they're dead, right? That's the definition of death. But there's no obvious signs of death here. And when you put him on the monitor, you see a PEA, which indicates that there's actually some cardiac activity. So this is a very special situation with these patients. Now there's two types of trauma arrest. There's blunt trauma, which is the majority of our traumatic injuries, and there's penetrating trauma. And these are two very different categories and it's important to separate them in your mind when you're evaluating your patients because there absolutely is a difference in their treatment and in their outcomes. If you have a patient who's in blunt traumatic arrest, that means no pulse and not breathing, there is a 98% mortality for these patients. Usually this is an incredibly severe multi-system trauma with a lot of areas of internal bleeding that even a surgeon is gonna have a difficult time fixing. As opposed to penetrating trauma, which is either gunshot wounds or stabbings, And usually these have a little bit better chance of survival because there's usually only one hole that needs to be repaired. And if you can get these patients to a surgeon relatively quickly, there's a chance that that hole can be fixed and the bleeding can be stopped. These are the patients that if it's a wound to the chest, they're likely going to get a thoracotomy when they get to the emergency department. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen a thoracotomy before, but it's a very invasive last-ditch effort to save someone's life and involves um, basically entering the left chest cavity to expose the heart and try to find the source of bleeding. So what do you do? Actually, there's just three things if you find a patient in trauma arrest that I need you to remember. First is open that airway. You've got your patient lying there on the concrete, unconscious, unresponsive, no pulse, but a PEA. Do a jaw thrust, use your adjuncts, and you can even try supplemental oxygen if you want. They might just be hypoxic and need a little assistance. Also, if there's advanced life support on scene, do bilateral chest decompression in case there's a tension pneumothorax. And then reassess for a pulse. If this is a blunt trauma arrest and you don't get a pulse back, then stop. You're not going to get a pulse back and there's nothing anyone can do here. Remember, this is a pulseless and apneic patient. If you have a penetrating trauma with a PEA greater than 40 and you're within 10 minutes of the university, go ahead and transport this patient. 
even if you've opened the airway and you've decompressed the chest and they haven't gotten a pulse back, if you still have that PEA greater than 40, go ahead and take them to the hospital because they might benefit from that thoracotomy. So the difference between blunt and penetrating trauma is that if PEA continues in blunt trauma with no pulse, even after interventions, you're going to stop because there's nothing anyone can do, even at the hospital. But in penetrating, again, you want to get them to the hospital because there is a chance that we might be able to repair that injury. So what happens if the engine beats the rescue there and you only have BLS capabilities on scene? Well, there's a lot of things that BLS can do to get ready for ALS to get there. So you're absolutely capable of opening and securing that airway, whether it's a LMA or a jaw thrust. Expose that chest so you can get the monitor on and see whether there's a PEA present or not. Put the monitor on, assess the rhythm, and if you want to go the extra step, you can actually think about controlling that C-spine and getting the longboard ready for a load and go situation if it's indicated. So what happens if the patient, you do decide to load and go, but they lose their pulse on the way to the hospital? There's actually a lot of things that we can do. It's the things that we can reverse. So this is where your H's and T's come into play. We can stop massive hemorrhage, use a tourniquet or a pelvic binder. You can correct hypoxia by opening the airway and giving supplemental O2. You can decompress the tension pneumothorax. You can try to correct hypotension by giving IV fluids. And you can protect against hypothermia. Now we're going to talk about why all these are life-saving and why they're important. When we talk about tension pneumothorax, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the pathophysiology of this uh, disease process, but I wanted to show you a picture because it's really illustrative of what's going on and why it causes people to die. And I know you're not all used to looking at chest x-rays like I am, but we're going to walk through it step by step. So what you see here is a chest x-ray. The patient's heart the, patient, the left side of the patient is over here where you see the bullet. The right side is over here. Now what's happening on this x-ray, you'll see that the bullet has caused a pneumothorax and the lung has collapsed. Where this red line is has collapsed the lung into a little ball and has pushed it over to the patient's right side of the chest. And so what you have is every time that patient takes a breath, there's more and more air accumulating in between the ribs and the lung to make that lung collapse even farther. And what that's doing is creating a lot of pressure in the left side of the chest, and it's actually pushing the heart over into the patient's right side of the body where it doesn't belong. Now why that's bad is because the heart, as you remember, it gets the blood flow back from the body from the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. Now these are both veins, and veins collapse very, very easily. And as the heart is pushed over into the right side of the chest, the veins actually kink, and the heart is no longer able to get blood flow back from the body. And so basically the patient instantly goes into shock. And some of the things you learn about start to make sense why you're taught to look for tracheal deviation in attention pneumothorax or why there's hypotension because there's actually no blood for the heart to push out or why you'll see JVD because the blood is backing up into the neck because it can't get into the heart. And so the treatment for attention pneumothorax is to do a needle decompression right there at the second intercostal space and basically let that air out of the chest so that the lung can reinflate. And once the lung reinflates, then the heart's going to move back over and be able to fill again. Now this is a picture of attention hemothorax. Same thing. The patient's left side is over here on the right side of the screen, and the patient's right side is on the left, so it's as if you're looking at looking at the patient face to face. And again, you see bullet fragments in the chest. You see some up here near the airway and some bullet fragments over here near the diaphragm and the stomach on the left side. This is a chest that's full of blood, but it's essentially the same physiology. The left chest is filling with blood and it's pushing the heart over to the right. And it's a little bit more difficult to see here, but the blood, there's so much blood that it's pushing the trachea over into the right side of the chest. And again, the heart is being pushed over as well. So it's not just air that can cause the tension physiology, it's also blood. We treat it the same in the field by a needle decompression, 
Um, but it's important to know that air and blood can cause the same process. When we're talking about places that patients can bleed to death, there's actually only five that you need to know. And when we think about it, there's really only three that we can fix in the pre-hospital setting. We can stop the bleeding from the extremities and into the street by either doing direct pressure or a tourniquet. We can stabilize a femur and we can stabilize a pelvis. Now when we talk about injuries to the chest or the abdomen, those are usually going to need a surgeon and that's why we go to the ER. I'd like us to think about pelvic fractures for a minute because I don't think we consider them enough as a system when we have these blunt trauma patients. Again, I know you're not familiar with x-rays, but I wanted to use a picture to illustrate what we're talking about here. We're looking at a normal pelvis. What I like to see when I look at a pelvis x-ray is nice round circles. Here's a nice big pelvic inlet here, some obturator rings here, no abnormalities, no big space between the pubic symphysis. When we talk about a pelvic fracture, this is what an open book pelvic fracture looks like. You can see when you compare the two that the pubic symphysis is very wide and there's actually the whole left hip has basically been pulled away from the rest of the body right here. And there's also a femur fracture on this side. The reason this is important is when you think, it's easy to look at an x-ray and see bones and see broken bones, but what we forget, and what I forget sometimes too, is there's a lot of soft tissue and a lot of vasculature in there that's been just as disrupted as those bones have. And when you're thinking about pelvic vasculature, look at all these veins and arteries in there and think about the force that it took to pull that pelvis apart and think what it did to all those vessels. That's why binding the pelvis is incredibly important. Most of the people who have a bad pelvic fracture have venous bleeding, but it's a lot of it, and you can bleed to death in your pelvis. However, in the pre-hospital setting, we have the ability to kind of tamponade that. Even though we can't get our hands in there and we're not surgeons to put direct pressure, we have an ability to do a pelvic binder. And it doesn't have to be the fancy prefabricated ones. It can be as simple as a sheet. It's just very important you get it located over the proper position in the hips. You want to go right over the greater trochanters on the lateral aspect of the hips and kind of bring those hips together and close that fracture. Another consideration when we're talking about ways to stop bleeding when you have an unstable hypotensive tachycardic patient is to consider the femur fracture. Again, when you look at the x-ray, we see just a broken bone, and you can usually tell by just looking at the patient whether the femur is broken or not. Always we check for distal pulse and movement and sensation in any fracture, but what we need to think about is the soft tissues underlying that fracture that have been disrupted. When you look at this femur fracture, those bone fragments are just as sharp as a knife. And when you look at the soft tissues underlying the bone, you see how many vessels are in that leg that can be disrupted. And it's very easy to lose a liter or two of blood into your leg. So by stabilizing that fracture and stopping that knife-like bone fragment from wiggling around and causing more soft tissue injury, it's important to stabilize that leg and minimize the bleeding there. Another important thing that we can do for our patients is to keep them warm. Hypothermia is a terrible thing in a trauma patient. In fact, the, the trauma surgeons call this the triangle of death. And what happens to our patients here is that when they're bleeding, they get cold, they start to clamp down. And as they clamp down and they're losing blood, their body preferentially sends that precious blood to the heart and the lungs and the brain to keep their vital functions alive. But what happens to the peripheral tissues is they get ischemic. So acid builds up out there. And as acid builds up, the coagulation factors in our body no longer work the way that they're supposed to because they're activated during normal physiological circumstances. And so you have a cold patient who's bleeding, who's experiencing acidemia, then their coagulation factors don't work right. And it's a cycle where they just continue to bleed and get cold and coagulopathic. And so we can prevent part of that by keeping them warm and stopping part of that acidosis from happening. Now, everyone is asking about CPR and trauma arrest. Trauma arrest, remember, it's a leaky pipe problem. It's not a pump problem. It's very, very different from cardiac arrest when you just have essentially a pump that has quit working, but you have a closed circuit 
where you can take over the pump, the function of the pump and circulate the blood for the pump that's not working. But here, if we continue to circulate blood, it's just going to push essentially more blood out of all of the holes. So until the holes are fixed, CPR is not going to work. That's why we're focusing on the H's and T's and the things that we can correct. So there's one exception to this rule, and it's a rule where if you think there's a medical arrest that led to the trauma arrest, then work it as a normal cardiac arrest. So for example, maybe the little old lady who drove her car into a pole, and you get there, and it doesn't seem like a significant mechanism, but she's pulseless and apneic. I would have a high suspicion for something medical leading to that trauma. And if that's the case, nobody's going to fault you for going ahead and doing your ACLS algorithms and working that as a normal cardiac arrest, including CPR and epinephrine. Here's a look at our trauma arrest protocol. I'd encourage you to look through it if you haven't already. Um, and in the context of that protocol, let's go through these cases again. So case number one, your dispatch is the 29 Delta, the auto versus pedestrian. It's the guy who's laying there in the street, unresponsive, not breathing, with no obvious signs of death and a PEA of 30. So what is this? This is a blunt trauma arrest. So what did we just talk about doing here? We're going to do our three things, remember? We're going to open his airway, whether that's a jaw thrust or some adjuncts or even some supplemental oxygen. We're going to decompress his chest just in case he's got that tension pneumo. And then we're going to reassess him. If at the end of those efforts he's still in PEA and it's less than 30, then we're going to stop. There's really nothing more anyone can do for him. You don't need to contact an MSEP here. It's written in the guidelines that you can terminate this by yourself. Case number two. This is the 29 Delta with the 15-year-old female who was entrapped and with agonal breathing who's unresponsive and loses pulses en route to the hospital. Again, this is a blunt trauma arrest, but what can we do for her while we have the transport time to the hospital? So remember the H's and T's. We're going to control any bleeding that we can. We're going to secure an airway and prevent that hypoxia. Decompress her chest. Obtain IV access and give fluids in case this is due to hypovolemic shock. Splint those injuries. Remember those bones that are causing a lot of soft tissue and vascular injuries that we can't see. So splint the pelvis, splint the femur. And very importantly is to keep this patient warm and try to prevent that coagulation cascade and the propensity for more bleeding. So all of those six things that we just mentioned are going to be most important to reverse her loss of a pulse, whereas CPR is really not going to help that much. So remember to focus on your H and T's on the way to the hospital with these patients. That said, I know it's pretty awkward to sit in the back of an ambulance and feel like you're not doing anything. So if you need it for your own mental health, no one is going to fault you for doing CPR. Just understand that it's not going to be effective and it's likely not going to change the outcome. I would much rather see you focus on the things that you can do to try to reverse those H and T's. So case number three, this is the young man who was shot in the chest and he's unconscious and not breathing, but he has a PEA of 60. This is a penetrating arrest. And so it's a load and go situation. We know that we're less than 10 minutes away from the hospital. He's got a PEA greater than 40. He's meeting criteria to go. We can still decompress his chest. We can still establish an airway and obtain IV access and try to treat that hypovolemic shock. Another important thing to do is try to prevent that hypothermia. After you've exposed him to look for other injuries, go ahead and cover him up and try to keep him warm. Remember, CPR is not indicated here. If you have any questions about any of these scenarios or any other scenarios you encounter, um, please feel free to either email me or contact your 7-8 to discuss them. Thank you for your time.